I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations in the name of our Lord. I hope you're having a fabulous day. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. With me, Page, your host. Caffeine imbued host, I might add. Ah. And for the Bible portion today, we're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 5. And we're going to be focusing on the guilt offering. And then I'm just going to give a some thoughts at the end of this, comparing these five offerings we've talked about. Um, when I began this portion of, of the Old Testament Leviticus, I had my doubts about whether I had the capability of pulling anything useful out of these things about the sacrifices, because it's a system that's no longer in place. All right, they, there's no sacrificial system in place. And I'm going to be totally honest, um, I don't feel like I have the credentials to speak about something so Jewish centric as what the author is talking about in Leviticus, but God does not disappoint, and He gave me something that I can take away from it, and I'm going to share that with you. And uh, I finally had like a little light starting to go on in the back of my head concerning these five offerings, and I'm going to share that with you after we finish up chapter five. And uh, but I'm going to be honest. This is going to take more research and more thinking on my part. Um, so down the road, I'll probably bounce back to this because I have a feeling, I, I just get the sense that I'm right on the verge of a breakthrough of understanding something really, really, really important that I'm missing. So anyway, so let's get started. Chapter 5. Take off my old man eyes here. If anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they've seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. If anyone becomes aware that they are guilty, if they unwittingly touch anything ceremonially, un ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of an unclean animal, wild or domestic, or any unclean creature that moves along the ground, and they are unaware that they've become unclean, then they come to realize their guilt or if they touch human uncleanness, anything that would make them unclean, even though they're unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt, or if anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter one might carelessly swear about, even though they are unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt, when anyone becomes aware that they're guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they've committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. Now, again, the, the, the writer here keeps bringing back, if they unwittingly do this, if they do something not knowing that it was wrong, that it was a sin, that it, this is really a telltale sign into the heart of mankind. The fact is, the people that will be that are that they're talking about here are walking through life and they're not trying to sin. They're not trying to do whatever sin they committed. It they just did it in unintentionally. They didn't realize it was sin. That tells you that sin is part and parcel of their nature. See, like I said before, we aren't See, how's it, how's it go? We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. 
The reason these things unwittingly happen is because that's part of our nature. We're going to sin. We're going to break God's commandments. We're going to break God's laws. We're going to break God's precepts. We are going to sin. We are, at our core, sinners. We are not good people who accidentally do bad things. Paul says in Romans, there's nobody that seeks God, not one. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul paints a very dire picture of human nature. And the writer in Leviticus is backing that up because there's a whole set of statements here talking about people who sin accidentally. (laughs) They're not trying to sin, but they sin anyway because that's their nature. Um, It's like uh, somebody said once, um, if you were to put lettuce in a cat's food dish day after day after day, it would go uneaten. Why? Because it's not the cat's nature to eat lettuce. We not only sin knowingly, we sin unknowingly. And that's really all this stuff that's come up. You know, it talks about unintentional sin. It talks about um, you're doing something. You don't know it was bad, and then you find out it's bad. Well, you're supposed to confess it, and there's a sacrifice you've got to give for it. So anyway, he's just backing up what he said in chapter four. Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. They are to bring them to the priest who shall first offer the one for the sin offering. He is to wring its head from its neck, not dividing it completely, and to splash some of the blood of the sin offering against the side of the altar. The rest of the blood must be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The priest shall then offer the other as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and make atonement for them for the sin they've committed, and they will be forgiven. If, however, they can't even afford two doves or two young pigeons, they are to bring as an offering for their sin a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour for a sin offering. They must not put olive oil or incense on it because it's a sin offering. They are to bring it to the priest who shall take a handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar on top of the food offerings presented to the Lord. It is a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them for any of these sins that they've committed and they will be forgiven. The rest of the offering will belong to the priest as in the case of the grain offering. So all these offerings, they overlap. All right, they they have the same basic premise they're uh they're for the sin of the of the worshiper that's coming to to bring these sacrifices some of the sins intentional some of the sins unintentional but because of the fact that there there's unintentional sin and intentional sin these sacrifices are going to keep coming because as soon as this sacrifice is done and atonement is made for the sin you've committed you're going to do it again. You're going to do something else and you're going to have to come back. But that's not the point of these sacrifices. When you take the long-term approach, the when, when you take what I call the 10,000 foot view, where you're up above everything, 10,000 feet above, and you can see the huge big picture, the big picture is this. There is a Messiah, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb who was slain before the beginning of the world. All of these sacrifices have this in common, with the exception of the grain offering, because there's no animal involved. An innocent animal's blood is shed. An innocent's blood is shed for the remission of sin, for the redemption of the of the sinner. And in almost every case, the sinner lays his hand on the head of that sacrifice, and then the sinner slaughters the animal and then gives the animal to the priest for the priest to intercede on their behalf. The one who is in need of sacrifice sacrifices the one thing that can save him. That's why Jesus dying on the cross, if you want to get at its most brutal uh, definition, we slaughtered him. But Paige, I wasn't there. It's 2,000 years ago. How could that be? The sin nature requires 
a blood sacrifice. So even if we, whether or not we were there at the foot of the cross physically, our sin nature says that we slaughtered him. He died because of us. He died for us. He bought redemption for us. And everything these sacrifices point to, or these five sacrifices point to, they all have at their core this thought that the blood of the innocent buys redemption for the sinner. All right, so now we're going to look at the guilt offering. This is the fifth offering. The Lord said to Moses, when anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally, there we go again, that word. When anyone's unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, they are to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value in silver according to the sanctuary shekel. It is a guilt offering. They must make restitution for what they fail to do in regard to the holy things, pay an additional penalty of a fifth of its value, and give it all to the priest. The priest will make atonement for them with the ram as a guilt offering, and they will be forgiven. This guilt offering. All right, this is someone who has been found guilty. They not only bring a sacrifice, but they personally have to pay an amount in silver. The redemption price. They bring the sacrifice and it's sacrificed like all the other sacrifices are done. And then they also have to pay a penalty of silver for their guilt. Uh, Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. That's what's required. Here, the wages of sin is a certain amount of silver. But again, it's a type of what's coming. And in the bigger picture, Paul says the wages of sin is death. So if you were to uh, bring your a ram to the priest to offer as a sacrifice for guilt offering, you've been found guilty, then the ram's blood is called required and yours is required. That's really what Paul is saying in Romans. The wages of sin is death and it's your death. However, again, this guilt offering is a picture looking forward to the one who would not only pay the blood sacrifice for our guilt, but he would also take our place in the death that was is required of us. The wages of sin is death, but it's not ours now. Christ, Messiah, has paid the death penalty for us. We slaughtered him, and he willingly died for us. I mean, there's just, there's too much there to think about almost without just getting absolutely blown out of the water. If anyone sins and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though they don't know it, they're guilty and will be held responsible. They are to bring to the priest as a guilt offering a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. And this way, the priest will make atonement for them for the wrong they've committed unintentionally, and they will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. They have been guilty of wrongdoing against the Lord. Again, unintentional, but that doesn't mean they're not guilty. I didn't mean it. That doesn't mean you're not guilty. Guilt is guilt. Guilt is the price. Is the, guilt is the, is the thing that is assigned to you if you've done something wrong. I stole something from a store. I'm guilty. I've hurt my neighbor. I'm guilty. I've sinned against God. I'm guilty. I've sinned against my children, my wife. I'm guilty. Here's the good news. This guilt offering, the ram, innocent blood is shed. And Jesus takes it one step further. You know that silver that you have to pay as part of your restitution for this guilt offering? Jesus steps forward and takes that on himself as well. So there you go. There's our five offerings. Now, here's my thoughts on this. And these thoughts are going to expand because God's got my attention. Um, I'm going to be doing some more thinking about this. But let's do a quick review and then I'll be done. The burnt offering, the very first offering we talked about, demonstrates we have no part in our atonement. We place our hand on the 
head of the animal that takes our sin and dies for it. The sacrifice and the shed blood accomplish this for us. The sacrifice takes our place. It's a picture of Jesus. Number two, the grain offering. Giving thanks for God's provision. Many times following on the heels of the burnt offering. By bringing the first fruits of the harvest, faith in God is demonstrated. And it's also a way of, give, of thanking God for what the burnt offering has accomplished. You sinned. The, sl- the blood of the innocent is shed. And you are You have received atonement. So let's give thanks. God has provided not only for your physical needs, but for your spiritual needs as well. Three, the fellowship or the peace offering. This celebrates the fact that fellowship with God has been restored. Why? Well, because of what happened in number one. You've gotten atonement, right? So fellowship with God has been restored again through the shed blood of the sacrifice. An innocent's blood is shed. The sin offering points to the fact that our unintentional sin demonstrates our true nature, our sin nature. It's also covered by the sacrifice of an innocent. Though dead in sin, we can be purified through the shed blood of an innocent, a a perfect sacrifice, one who is without sin. We can be released from the deadly clutches of our sin nature, which if not dealt with, would doom us to a certain eternity away from God. By the way, they call that hell. The sin offering points out the fact that we are by nature sinners. We aren't good people who do bad things accidentally, unintentionally. We're bad people who do bad things intentionally or unintentionally because that's our nature. Our sin nature is us. And we will do evil. We will do bad things. Now, the guilt offering, which we just talked about, when one is unfaithful to God, even if it's unintentional, guilt can be erased by a sacrifice. But part of the price for the guilt falls on the offender. He must make restitution. This offering is also intended for those who cheat their neighbors. Remember in Romans where Paul says the wages of sin is death? Well, that's the price we have to pay for our guilt, for our sin. But Jesus steps in again and takes that on himself. He pays the price for our sin. He is our redemption. He buys our redemption. He pays the restitution called for by this sacrifice. So each one of these sacrifices points to Christ, points to an aspect of his work for us on the cross and his and his resurrection. There's so much more here. I know there is. I feel like I'm out gold mining and I've just pulled a couple nuggets out of the ground, and I know that there's a gold mine shot through with gold that I've yet to uncover. But I think I'm onto something here, and I'm sure I'll come back to it. Leviticus has a lot to say, and uh, it's going to go back and revisit more and more, give us more and more details on these sacrifices, and that's, I'm sure, going to open up the door for, uh, for, some more reassurance from my God about how wonderful and incredible the salvation that Jesus has bought for us is. <sighs> well, that's enough for now. I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to think over the weekend and we'll be coming back on Monday with uh, Leviticus chapter six. I'm Paige. Here's my coffee. Folks, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. 